Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Queen Amon. That's right. Or should I say, yes, Queen? No, actually I shouldn't. No one should. But anyway, I'm very excited to be showing you my technique for what many people consider the hardest, but also most delicious pastry in the world. Okay, for something to be worth this much effort, it has to be way past mind-blowing, and this is. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started by making a very simple bread dough, which will begin with some warm water, some white sugar, and some dry active yeast that we will let sit in a bowl for about 10 minutes to make sure it's alive. And then once we have proof of life, we will add a little bit of melted butter, most but not all of our flour, and a pinch of salt. And then what we'll do is grab our most experienced wooden spoon, and we'll go ahead and give this a stir until it comes together into a very, very, very wet sticky dough. And by the way, I'm using bread flour, which I think works the best, but all purpose should work as well. But anyway, we'll go ahead and stir that together until it looks like this, at which point we'll dump the last half cup of our flour on the table and transfer our sticky dough onto that. And then what we'll do is sort of roll that around until it's coated in flour, at which point we'll start pushing and pressing and eventually kneading. And in a perfect world, by the time we've achieved a nice, soft, pretty sticky, elastic dough, all that flour will have been worked in. And the reason we just didn't add it all at once is because I'm not sure we need that much. So by using this method, is we knead it, once it feels like it's right and all the flour's not absorbed yet, we stop because it's right. But if you just dump everything in according to a recipe and start kneading, it may or may not be perfect. So long story short, this is how you really make bread. Okay, it really is a feel thing. And as luck would have it, that was the right amount of flour. And I did, in fact, end up with a beautifully soft, slightly sticky, fairly elastic dough, which we'll go ahead and transfer into a lightly buttered bowl. And then we'll cover that and let it sit for about an hour and a half or until it doubles in size. Yes, of course, in a warm spot. And what we'll do while we're waiting for that is make our seasoned sugar. Oh, yeah, you heard me. We're actually going to take white sugar and add some sea salt or kosher salt to it. And that is just one of the many secrets to this incredible pastry. All right, done correctly, this is both sweet and savory. So we'll go ahead and give that a mix and set it aside while we move on to prep our muffin pan, which means brushing generously with melted butter. And once that's set, we'll go ahead and spoon in our sugar and toss it around until the insides are coated. And yes, I missed, you could just put the sugar in the cups. And after we've spooned in a generous amount, what we'll do is pick up the pan and give it the old shake a shake -a as well as a nice assortment of tips and turns. And once we're pretty sure everything's coated, we can flip that over to knock out all the excess. And sure, if you want to clean the top off a little bit, go ahead. That's not a bad idea, and I did. Oh, and speaking of cleanup, we want to make sure we scrape up any excess and add it back to our bowl, since we're going to need that stuff, as you will see. So we'll set that aside along with our prep pan, and we'll go back and check our dough. And this is what mine looked like after about 90 minutes. And then what we'll do once that's deflated as usual is transfer that onto a floured surface. And we will kind of press that down into a vaguely rectangular shape. And then using a rolling pin, plus just enough flour so it doesn't stick, we will roll that out into a rectangle somewhere between an eighth and a quarter inch thick. Oh, and if you were hoping for the exact measurements for the width and length, you were definitely on the wrong channel. But really, the exact size doesn't matter. Just get it close to what you're seeing here. And it's actually pretty hard to roll into a rectangle. So once we get it like this, we can just sort of stretch and pull it into the right shape. And then once that's set, what we'll do is take an entire stick of very, very cold butter. All right, mine was actually frozen in very hard. And we're gonna use this cheese grater to grate the entire stick onto our dough. And if possible, try to leave an inch unbuttered around the edges. And by the way, don't be a hero. When you get down to a little piece, just stop. Okay, don't lose a knuckle. And then what we'll do once that's set is flour our hands and gently but firmly press that butter in. And then what we'll do once that butter's been successfully flattened out is go ahead and fold this into thirds, just like a letter, if that helps. And then once folded, we'll go ahead and square that up the best we can by pressing, stretching, and or pulling. And that's it, our first phase is done. We'll go ahead and transfer that onto a sheet pan, wrap it in plastic, and pop it in the fridge for about 30 minutes. And by the way, if you thought an entire stick of butter was a ridiculously large amount for that little bit of dough, wait until you see what happens next. Because what we're gonna do after we chill that for 30 minutes is pull it back out, and we are gonna roll it back out into a rectangle, roughly the same size as our first one. 
Although for some reason I went the other direction. And just like the first rectangle, it's hard to do it just with a rolling pin. So don't be afraid to pull and stretch those corners. And it's also not a bad idea to make sure it's not sticking to the table. And then once that's set, believe it or not, we're gonna grate over another entire stick of very cold butter. So yes, by the time we're done with this, it's gonna contain a half a pound of butter. Although if it makes you feel any better, the authentic version has more. But anyway, we're gonna butter that and press it down again using some nicely floured fingers. And then we will fold that into thirds again. And just like the first time, once that's folded, we'll go ahead and square that up the best we can. But unlike the first time, we're not gonna refrigerate this. All right, what we're gonna do is dust it with flour and roll it back out into a rectangle. And once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and fold that into thirds. And I know someone out there just said, hey, you forgot the butter. Well, first of all, I'll do the jokes. And second of all, we don't need any more butter. Two sticks is plenty. But anyway, we'll fold that as shown. And using only as much flour as we need, we'll roll that out one more time. At which point we'll give that the last and final fold. And how many layers of butter did we build up? I'm not sure. I didn't count and I don't much care. But I do know we have enough. And then once we've completed that final fold, we'll go ahead and transfer that to our sheet pan, wrap it in plastic, and transfer it into the fridge for at least an hour before we move to final assembly. And then once that dough has been thoroughly chilled, we'll roll it out, but not on flour. We're actually gonna sprinkle a generous amount of our seasoned sugar onto the table, onto which we will place our laminated dough. And before we start rolling, we'll apply a whole bunch of sugar to the top. And then what we're gonna do is roll this out, applying sugar often and generously to both sides as we roll. And once it feels like the sugar you've sprinkled on has been rolled in, put some more on. And one small heads up here, because that sugar and salt is gonna start pulling moisture from the dough, we don't wanna take a tremendous amount of time to do this. All right, so be quick, but don't hurry. And like I said, we'll keep rolling and sprinkling sugar, and you're gonna be surprised how much we can actually roll in. Okay, I'm not sure you're gonna use everything you mixed up, but you're gonna use a lot. And by the way, some people add the sugar as they're doing their turns and folds, but I prefer this method, and it seemed to work out very well. But anyway, we'll keep doing that, turning it occasionally, until we have a rectangle between an eighth and a quarter inch thick, at which point we'll stop and take a pizza cutter, and we will trim the edges. And keep in mind, we're eventually gonna cut 12 squares, which means cutting it three by four, which means we don't want a perfect square, although we do want the edges pretty straight. So you can see I'm doing a little fine tuning here. And do not under any circumstances throw away those scraps. You can just bake those off to make the world's best and most confusing cookies. But anyway, once I had that trimmed, I made two cuts this way to make three pieces, and then three cuts this direction, so that we hopefully end up with 12 close to square pieces. And those are definitely not perfect, but as I like to say, close enough for YouTube. And that's it, once those are cut, we'll go ahead and transfer those into our pan. After, yes, you guessed it, sprinkling on some more sugar. And then there are so many different ways you can shape these. But my favorite is to do it so all four corners meet in the middle, which is what I thought I was doing here, except my fingers had their own idea. And as soon as I placed that in, I realized it didn't look quite right. So I did another one and figured it out. And here's how I really wanted to do it. Okay, all four corners coming together in the center. All right, you see that? That I think is gonna give us the best looking queen of mom. So that's how I did the rest. And I actually went and refolded the first one, which by the way would have worked. And many people like to do them that way. So suit yourself. I mean, you are after all the leprechaun of your queen of mom. And I know leprechauns aren't French, but neither is this name. It actually has Celtic origins, believe it or not. Oh, by the way, don't be scared. This dough is gonna to continue to rise. So if it looks thicker when we shape it, that's why. And then what we'll do once those are all panned up is top them with a little more sugar, because why the heck not? And while some people do like to take their finger and kind of push it down the center to seal everything, I don't and don't think you should. Okay, I think that's gonna prevent them from popping out and make it sort of the crown shape I'm going for. All right, people love pointy food. And then what I like to do is let these sit for 10 minutes to give them a little tiny bit of a proof, at which point those are ready to transfer into the center of a 375 degree oven for about 25 to 30 minutes, or until beautifully browned and puffed, and basically looking like one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen. And then very, very important, if you don't pull these out of the pan while they're hot, you are not pulling them out of the pan. 
Okay, once that salted caramel cools, they're going to stick in the pan and you're never going to get them out. So while they're hot, carefully and quickly transfer those to a rack, where you should probably let them cool for at least 15 minutes before attempting to eat. And while I was waiting, I gave them the old fork test, so you could hear exactly how crispy these get. Oh yeah, fork don't lie. And then after waiting an excruciatingly long 15 minutes, I went in for a taste and bit into the smallest, ugliest one. And that, my friends, has to be tasted to be believed. Okay, we're talking sweet, salty, buttery, crunchy, sticky, tender. It just has everything. And even though there was like a half pound of butter in these, they are not greasy. They are not heavy. How is that possible? I don't know. And I don't actually even need to know. So I went ahead and plated one up so I could take some pictures. And of course, eat another one. And while you certainly don't want to overdo it, the salt really is the key here. Okay, if you like salted caramel, you're going to go nuts for these. It's like a salted caramel sauce meets a croissant meets a potato chip. And right here, you're going to get a great look at those beautiful layers we created with all that buttering and folding. And of course, that's always the big question at the end of one of these videos. Was it worth it? And there's really no answer for that. I mean, is running a marathon worth it? Is climbing Everest worth it? Swimming across an ocean? Or trying to make pizza crust out of cauliflower? I mean, there really is no answer, is it worth it? Although, you know what? After that last bite, I'm going to say I do know. And it is worth it. Which is why I'm going to finish by saying I really do hope you give these a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy.